Well, good evening. And many of you are familiar faces, but some of you are new faces. So to those of you who are new, um, a big welcome to the Blavatnik School of Government. I'm Nairi Woods. I work here. And I'm thrilled to have today the opportunity to invite you to have this conversation with Professor Joe Nye. Joe has for a long time been one of Harvard's most brilliant professors, um, but he's also been Assistant Secretary of Defense in the United States. He's been Chairman of the National Intelligence Council of the United States. He's been one of those rare professors that has moved taking wisdom into the government, out of the government, using it in the classroom, back into the government, back out, and it gives him a very rare insight into both American foreign policy and what it means for American government. So, Joe, can I start by just saying a huge welcome. You have been part of this school since the time it was just an idea in some of our heads. And um, you've been a visiting professor in the school since then, and we've been hugely grateful to you. So a warm welcome to Professor Joe Nye. Thank you very much, Nairi. It's, it's nice to be back uh, at Blavatnik, but also to see this extraordinary building. It, it, I call it the house that Nairi built. Um, I can remember talking with her way back when in, uh, in University College in this over lunch and so forth, and the idea that we would someday be sitting here in this magnificent palace is, <laughs> was, was not what we were, we were thinking. How do you take the next little step? <laughs> so you've done an extraordinary job, and I must say, having uh, had the, unfortunately my visit this year is very short, um, but uh, the last two years I've had the chance to be around long enough to have met a good number of the students and been really impressed by the quality of the selection. So it's a, you're off to a, a good start, not because of architecture, though that helps, but by the way you filled the building. So uh, I'm pleased with, uh, with what you've done, and uh, congratulations to you all. Uh, my, I'm advertised to say a little bit about American foreign policy, and uh, what I will say is going to be very brief, because I think the most interesting thing will be questions. And I have a lot of questions. <laughs> but but uh, Nairi told me that she has a, a, a rule for the school that before anybody does anything, they declare their interest it's in the British Parliament, you know, that no hidden interest. I will start then by declaring interest. I am officially listed as uh, co-chairman of Hillary Clinton's Asia group, the group that advises her about Asia. So I am not impartial. Uh, I, I am, have written and am very critical of Trump. And I want to try to distinguish between, um, I don't want to be partisan. On the other hand, um, I want to try to be as objective as I can without uh, being partisan, but it's going to be very hard. So I declare this conflict uh, right at the start. This is a very strange period in American foreign policy. Um, Trump is running uh, with, with, under a baseball hat that says, make America great again. Um, the, if that, the implication is that America is not great now, and Trump is, is uh, playing into a uh, uh, feeling of decline that is true among some significant minority, like 30 or 40 percent of the American population, according to polls. Uh, I wrote a book, uh, which was published about a year ago, called Is the American Century Over? It's a little book, uh, but it tries to ask, is the United States in decline? Is this the Chinese century? And basically, my answer is no. Uh, that it's not the Chinese century, the Americans are not in decline. But, uh, and I'm not going to bother you with all the <coughs> no numbers and facts on that, because you can either ask about them or you can read the book or take it on faith, whatever. But, uh, but 
what is interesting is um, uh, it, about Trump and this year's foreign policy is for the first time in 70 years, you have somebody who's challenging a bedrock of American uh, consensus on foreign policy. Americans have had very great differences on foreign policy for a long time. Witness Vietnam, which tore the country apart, or witness uh, the Iraq War, which is deeply divisive. But ever since uh, 1946 uh, or so, uh, when Harry Truman was faced with the question of what do we do when Britain can no longer produce stability in the Eastern Mediterranean, a Britain that had been too weakened by World War II to be able to maintain the balance of power, uh, Truman decided to step in. And the net effect of that was to change a policy that had been uh, a bedrock of American policy, which was to stay out of European affairs, George Washington's advice of no entangling alliances. Woodrow Wilson violated that by sending American troops into Europe in World War I, and, uh, but he brought them home again. And the American reaction against Wilson's interventions in Europe and his effort to create a global collective security system was a virulent isolationism of the 1930s, uh, which I think was partly responsible for the rise of uh, the worst decade we've had in the 20th century, a decade marked by war and genocide. Uh, so the Americans had become the most powerful country in the world at the beginning of the 20th century, but had dabbled in the balance of power, but then went back home. And in the process of going back home, and not only created an isolationism at home, but also a vacuum abroad and a pretty bad period. And in after World War II, uh, Truman basically, with the advice of a group of people that were sometimes called the wise men, and I, I know that sounds like a sexist term, but alas, they were only men, uh, but like Dean Acheson and John McCloy and others, decided to stay involved. And Truman's decision to leave American troops overseas was profoundly important. And you have the Marshall Plan in 48, you have NATO in 49, you have the Korean War in 50, and then 10 years later, Dwight Eisenhower creates an alliance with Japan, and you still have American troops in Europe, in Korea, and in Japan to this day. And that has been of very great importance to maintaining a balance of power. Now, you can like it or dislike it. We can assign different normative values to it. But it has, as a factual basis, been central to the global balance in the period uh, since 46. Now, that has been accepted in America. It's, there's been a broad foreign policy consensus shown by polls that even when people were fighting each other in the streets over Vietnam, they weren't fighting about getting out of NATO or breaking the U.S.-Japan alliance. And for the first time, we have a candidate of a major political party, Donald Trump, who is calling that consensus into question. That is really radical. When Trump talks about possibly withdrawing from NATO or uh, letting the Japanese and the Koreans develop their own nuclear weapons rather than, than sheltering under an American umbrella, that's a big, big difference. Or as Trump would say, that's huge. And I think the interesting thing about it is not only will it make a big difference in the global balance of power, for example, if you ask how will East Asia play out with the rise of China and with a Japan that goes nuclear, that's going to be a very different East Asia than one which has the alliance system that you see now. Uh, similarly, if you have, as I argue in this book, 
is the American century over. If you have a Russia, which unlike China is a rising power, Russia is a declining power, uh, what are the risks that a Putin will take? You might say if Russia's a declining power, we shouldn't worry, except declining powers are more risk accepted. I worry less about China than about Russia. And you can look at this in 1914 and see that the declining power, Austria-Hungary, was the one that took the risks of what they thought was going to be the Third Balkans War, but which turned out to be a classic disaster of four years of war. Uh, but Austria took that risk because it was otherwise it was in decline; it would otherwise uh, have that decline accelerated. That's why it wanted teach Serbia a lesson. The point is that what will Europe look like if there is no NATO or NATO is weakened? And if Putin, instead of having to think about whether Article 5 is a valid guarantee when he looks at the Russian minority in Estonia, says, you know, uh, there was a Russian minority that I can use for hybrid warfare, I, it'll be a different world in Europe as well as a different world in Asia. So that kinds of things, and, th and then of course the third, uh, in addition to these global balance issues, there's the issue of nuclear nonproliferation, which has been a bedrock of American foreign policy uh, since the 50s. And you remember when John Kennedy was president, he expected that the world would have 25 countries with nuclear weapons by the 1970s. Today, there are nine countries with nuclear weapons. Not great, but a lot better than 25. And if you'd had 25 by 1970, you would probably have a lot more than that today. Would that be a more stable world? I doubt it. So when Trump makes the kinds of statements he's making, he's going to renegotiate alliances. He's going to be unpredictable. Unpredictability is the opposite of being a trusted ally. Uh, these are, are really quite dramatic and radical statements. So in that sense, what we're seeing in American foreign policy is something that we haven't seen uh, again since the 1940s. Now, if, uh, what are the chances that Trump will be president? I think not. Uh, I think that uh, if you look at the, the uh, uh, the way Trump got the Republican nomination, uh, it was quite extraordinary. If there hadn't been 17 candidates, if Cruz hadn't essentially been a stalking horse who destroyed Marco Rubio, who would otherwise have been the, the moderate uh, solution, uh, and if Trump hadn't been so brilliant at manipulating the new media, the 24-7 uh, uh, type of uh, cable news, plus his experience in reality TV, plus his reinforcing this with Twitter and social media, uh, I, I think Trump was able to use the system in a way which surprised people. And by the time the Republican Party woke up to what was happening, it was too late, a very uh, uh, important Republican consultant who was at the Kennedy School a few weeks ago uh, uh, talking about this. Uh, it was off the record, so I can't, uh, can't name him, but said, you know, basically, uh, he had, this man had been working in the Jeb Bush campaign, and he had raised over $100 million for Jeb Bush. He said Trump got about $2 billion of free publicity uh, by his ability to manipulate the media. In other words, it, it, it swapped Bush. It sucked the oxygen out of the system. And so, so there's an argument that if you look at the Republican electorate, it was structurally vulnerable because of the number of candidates, because of the strategies that were chosen by number two and number three, and because Trump was brilliant at manipulating the new media. But the Republican electorate is 90% white. 
and the electorate in November will be 70% white. In addition to that, uh, Trump has a strategy in which he uses ad hominem remarks which have been very uh, anti-women. I mean, it, it, whatever else you say about them, he's had derogatory comments about particular women and women in general. And that means that the, the percentage of the electorate which he has, uh, has got to win in terms of minorities and women make it almost impossible for him to win. So I think, are we likely to see this foreign policy switch in the 180 degrees way that, uh, that I described? I think the probabilities are low. But history is always full of surprises. And uh, just like the Austrians didn't expect four years of war, which was going to lead to the collapse of their empire and loss of the emperor's throne, uh, suppose there's a um, suppose there's a Bataclan event in October. Is it possible that enough Americans will have a reaction of fear that will say, "I'll take somebody." <coughs> as crazy as Trump because he's strong rather than take a risk with a woman? I don't know. I mean, it's some possibility that Trump would become president. I spoke to a, uh, there, I gather that uh, if you are a betting person and you go to Ladbrokes, you can get something in the range of 30% that Trump would become president. I haven't checked the odds in the, in the last week or so, but that was reported to me a week or so ago. Uh, but I was talking to a friend of mine um, who is a professional cephologist in the United States and follows these things carefully. And I said, what do you think the odds are that Trump would become president? He said, oh, I think it's probably about one in six. And I said, well, that's something of a relief. He said, do you like Russian roulette? <laughs> and so we are at a, at a really strange period in American foreign policy, and I've tried to describe this, um, I'm partisan, but I've tried to describe it in a way which is at least reasonably objective. I don't think the factual statements I've made are tilted by my partisan preference. The value statement of whether this is a good or bad policy is affected by it, but my descriptions of the electorate of the strategy Trump has had came from a Republican, not from, from my own leanings. So that's as best I can do to, to give you uh, uh, an analysis of the situation. But if you really want to know what's going to happen in foreign policy, my true and honest answer is I don't know. But Joe, can I, can I take you where I think you don't want to go? Um, <laughs> But to really, to, to just give us a glimpse of the foreign policy making machine in the United States. So let me take you to the morning after an election which does elect Donald Trump as president. We know he's a man that says both each thing and very often it's opposite. So when he says, you know, leave NATO, he could just as easily say not leave NATO. So there's, there's both a, there's a question about what really is the view that he might take forward, but that surely America, with its magnificent constitution, with its balance of powers, with its foreign policy-making machine of which you've been a very close part, could you, could you just walk us through President Trump elected, what of these platforms that he's put out there in a provocative way would have any likelihood of actually becoming American policy? Well, I, I think that the checks and balances and constraints would have an effect on him. Some people have said Trump is an American Mussolini, uh, and my reply to that is America's not Italy in 1922. Um, I, think, I think there are constraints on him. On foreign policy, what's interesting is you could try to get a guess on an answer to your question by saying, who's surrounding him? You know, who, if he, who are the people that will advise him? The answer is nobody 
knows or the five people that he has named are not traditional Republican foreign policy elites. Indeed, the major Republican foreign policy elites signed a letter back in the, in the campaign days when it was still contested, uh, saying they would not support Trump. Uh, and, uh, and the interesting question is, you, you can't say, well, there's John Bolton or there's Bob Zellick or, the, you know, you can't sort of say, here are the people around him. Because the five people he's named are people at the operational level in military and in intelligence. I mean, these are people nobody's heard of who've been, who've been, who are not known as strategists. So we're going now on, uh, so the, the first set of clues we use to answer your question is to say, okay, but who's surrounding him? And we don't know the answer to that. Uh, some of these people who signed the letter saying they'd never support Trump would indeed, um, will indeed wind up supporting him what a Republican friend of mine says are Vichy Republicans. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's hope there are some Vichy Republicans because we need somebody around him who, who uh, uh, will provide uh, advice in the mainstream tradition. If you go back and look at Trump's own views, um, since that seems to be the primary source of, of, uh, of where his ideas come from, uh, you can find statements he made as far back as the 1980s, which tend to be nativist and uh, uh, and not uh, not alliance oriented. I mean, complaining about the allies and not doing their share and and so forth. You can find Trump statements way back before he became a political candidate, which would indicate that some of this these attitudes are not totally new. Um, and then you, then, but then you have to balance that with the point that Trump is, is very much a pragmatist. He's, you know, he's not a, uh, he talks about the art of the deal. He prides himself on doing bargains. You can imagine him uh, doing a bargain on some things. I mean, the, the one that always amuses me most is this Mexican uh, uh, wall. He has said he will build a wall and make Mexico pay for it, to which one of my Mexican friends says, we've debated this carefully in Mexico and we accept on the 1842 border. <laughs> and, but, uh, but Trump, I think, you could imagine him going, uh, summoning Peña Nieto to Laredo on the American side of the border and reading a riot act in front of TV and, you know, going on and on about how tough he is. And Peña Nieto promised to put up barbed wire in Laredo, in Nuevo Laredo, and uh, uh, that more war will come in the future, and, you know, mess, Mexico will pay for some of it. And Trump declares victory, and then the issue is forgotten for four years. I mean, it, is that plausible? I don't know. I mean, it's as, it's, as pl it's, it's more plausible than the idea that we're going to build this wall and somehow make Mexico pay for it. What Trump has done is he's taken uh, tropes and moods and attached things to them, like build a wall and make Mexico pay for it, which have no policy reality. In other words, if you ask, you know, what would this really look like as a policy, there's nothing there. The person in the New York Times Bureau uh, who interviewed Trump, Trump came to the Washington Post and to the New York Times editorial board for um, uh, interviews, and uh, he answered questions, and one of the people who was asking the questions uh, uh, said the thing that was most disturbing is that after you asked the question, you got an answer. When you asked the follow-up question, there was no answer. I mean, there just wasn't anything there. So Trump, Trump has, has used, a, I mean, if you take an attitude of nativism uh, 
and the fact that Trump has played on this since he began to question Obama's birth certificate. And then you have this hat, Make America Great Again, which some people say should be translated as Make America White Again. And if this plays to the Republican primary electorate, it tells you why he's been successful at what he's done, but it doesn't tell you what a policy will look like. Will he do a deal? Well, he claims he's the great impresario of deals. Is he pragmatic in the sense that he'll change a position from being in favor of X uh, one year and non-X six months later? Yes, uh, if that's what pragmatic means. But what does it actually mean when it comes to withdrawing from NATO or putting a wall on the Mexican border? I don't think anybody knows. Maybe he doesn't. Can I have one last go at inviting you to reassure us, and then I'm going to open up to questions. <laughs> but one imagines... Don't me to say something cheerful? One imagines... No, no, not at all. But, um, you know, one, imag one imagines that once Donald Trump became president, he would find himself being given advice by the leaders of America's military by American State Department officials, by America's leading businesses, that he would quickly find himself at the receiving end of quite a lot of advice, that he might call on some of America's most eminent commentators, like Professor Joseph Nye, to come and help him make some decisions, that, that, that the apparatus of the presidency, that there is something other than the ad personum. I mean, the, the, the foreign policy that you're describing of Trump and five friends who may or may not know whether the rest of the world exists is one which suggests that the American political machine is empty. I mean, it's, it's been hollowed out or something. But can well, we not I take the assurance from the institutions of American democracy? Yeah, no, I, I think if you, if you pressed me hard and said, make a bet when I come back to, to uh, Blavatnik a year from now, in exile, and uh, <laughs> uh, and you say, "Ha! Ah, now watch. You know, let's watch him eat crow." Um, I think, basically, I would bet on what you just said. In other words, I think I think Trump is probably enough of a pragmatist and enough of a deal maker that uh, when uh, these forces close in on him of business and the State Department and the Republican elders and so forth, he will by and large uh, wind up with a deviation from foreign policy, but not, uh, not as radical as he sounds. So, for example, he'll go to the NATO allies and he'll say, you either get your budget up to 2% or else we're pulling troops out or something. And I suspect a number of NATO allies will put budgets up 2% and, uh, and Trump will then declare victory and then drop the issue. I mean, it's a little bit like my wall scenario. In other words, he'll, he'll show how tough he is with Peña Nieto, get some barbed wire put up by the Mexicans and then say, and what's more, there's more to come and he's promised me. And then the issue goes off the front burner because his advisors in the State Department and in business and so forth are going to say, drop it, Donald. And Donald will do enough to, to declare victory and then we'll follow the advice and drop it. So I think that it's unlikely that you're going to get this radical change in American foreign policy, even if Trump is elected. But, you know, uh, one has to be awfully careful in doing analysis not to let your preferences become the father or mother of your analysis. In other words, you've got to say, here are what the odds are, and I think the odds are as you described, <coughs> but I'm very cautious about letting my, my preferences shade those odds too much. This is why I've been somewhat if not gloomy, at, at least, um, trying to outline that, that there, there is a pessimistic uh, side to this. Just one, one la very last question from me. <laughs> I'm still looking for reassurance here. Yeah. 
But that was my cheerful side. Yeah. <laughs> no, but under, under President George W. <clears throat> Bush, when America made its decision to go to war in Iraq, which Donald Trump says was a wrong decision, um, the Secretary of Defense at the time said, I think he sacked at least one general and said, I don't want to be surrounded by people that tell me I can't do things. I want to be surrounded by people that tell me how to do things. And in so doing, it seemed that he sort of cut off his military experts and went sort of blindly on to plan the invasion of Iraq. And I just wonder, has that had a lasting legacy? Is the military now, you know, how likely is it that you'll see America's top generals come and give a forceful view to the president? Or did that, what, what happened after the Iraq war? Have the military gone back into their box or will they come out and assert their expertise? No, I think the military actually is, is pretty straightforward on this. I mean, I, having worked in the Pentagon, known a lot of these people, I, I think these, these are people who will say it as it is. Obviously, you shade things a bit, but I think, he, I think uh, you know, when, when General Shinseki, who was chief of staff of the Army, was asked to testify before Congress about how many troops would be needed in Iraq, um, he told, he gave an answer which was a high number, and that infuriated Paul Wolfowitz, uh, who was the deputy secretary. And Shinseki was sort of uh, in the doghouse and wasn't uh, reappointed. And, uh, but what strikes me is it didn't, I don't think that had a lasting effect. I think the problem for the military is more, uh, how, do you, how do you make clear what your military advice is, but then when a political leader says, you're going to do it anyway because I was elected and you weren't, then you have a democratic responsibility as a general to do something. You can say, boss, you're going to go off a cliff, and boss says, I want to go off a cliff and I was elected. You say, all right, here's, here's the easiest way to go off the cliff, or here's where the cliff is lowest to, the, to how far you're going to fall or something of, the, of that sort. So I think, I think that's the attitude of, of the American military. There's been an interesting ex a case, though, that's come up in the debate, which is the issue of torture, in which Trump has indicated that uh, uh, you know, torture is not off the table. And um, the, I don't think the acting or the active military have said anything about it, but several retired military have said publicly that if ordered to torture, they would not do it because it would violate the law and violate the Uniform Code of Military Conduct, which is law, and therefore their oath of office. And so if ordered to torture, they would refuse the order, which means they would have to resign. Now, this is, who knows what but, I mean, you could imagine a scenario uh, of that sort. I think, I doubt that it would actually come to that. But, but I think the, the military does try to, to, to walk a pretty straight line on this. I don't think there's a, a, a corrupting of, of their advice. Your questions. Um, where are the microphones? Can we bring a microphone up here? Cornelia, why don't you kick off? Thanks, my name is Cornelia Bauer. I'm one of the students here at the school. Um, from where? From Germany. I think, yeah, the vast majority of people would be very um, afraid of Trump becoming president, but one of the things that it could do is maybe shine light on the hollowness of his statements and put them to test of reality and maybe show his voters that most of these ideas are totally crazy. And I'm wondering if the odds play out as we predict them and he doesn't become president, what happens to these ideas and these broken taboos? How do you think it would affect um, Hillary's Clinton, Hillary Clinton's politics, for example? Do you think she'd be quite drawn to make amendments um, with her statements? Um, 
or how how do you think it will affect the Republican Party to go forward um, in the next election, for example? Do you think somebody else that is similar to to Trump would then have another go? Um, well, that's that's a really great question, and and again, I'm going to speculate because I don't know the answer, but fortunately, nobody does, so I can speculate without fear of contradiction. Um, is is Trump an aberration, or is this a trend? Um, Trump has already done, I think, a fair amount of damage to American soft power. And he may do damage to Hillary Clinton, not because she would adopt some of his foreign policy, but because he's going to run a very nasty ad hominem campaign. And so it, she is going to be uh, characterized throughout the campaign, not on the basis of policy, but on, in an ad hominem way, which is going to make it harder for her to govern. So I think, I think he's, uh, if, if, if she were running against, uh, let's say, Rubio, who was, many people thought was the, the likeliest survivor of the, of the moderate Republican establishment, uh, it, it would have been a normal campaign. And, uh, uh, but running against Trump, and she probably had more chance of losing to Rubio than losing to Trump, but running against Trump, I think she has more chance of beating Trump, but I think she is going to be beaten up in the process in a way which is going to make it harder for her to govern. Uh, so in that sense, Trump has already done damage, and I think the damage will continue, but I don't think it's going to affect her policy as much as her authority or legitimacy. But the interesting part of your question to me is uh, 2020. Are we, are we on a slide where we're now going to see that the formula that Trump used is a formula which is successful enough that it's going to be on whatever? You know, the conventional wisdom a few years ago was America politics is a plutocracy, and you just buy the office. Well, you know, it turns out Trump didn't spend much money. He's a billionaire, but he didn't spend his money. He figured out how to manipulate the system for free. So others can figure out how to manipulate the system for free. Uh, you, get, you, you say something outrageous. The press loves things that are outrageous. So you're on CNN or the Fox and so forth all the time. And then you reinforce it with Twitter. So when Hillary Clinton gave a very good speech on foreign policy last Thursday in San Diego, Trump issued a tweet about the judge in the case about Trump University being Mexican and prejudiced. That suddenly took a, it stepped on her Clinton's news story. You know, it suddenly sucked the oxygen out of this and he became the story yet again. So he's learned how to, how to use the the manipulation of reality TV, you're fired, along with 24-7 news. And if they don't call him, he calls them. And then reinforce it with social media, Twitter, and you wind up with a dominance of the news cycle, and you get all this TV for free. It's not because he's a billionaire, it's because he's very, very clever at what he does. Now, the question for 2020 is, if Trump loses, will people say, well, that was okay in 2016. It happened to win for him in a field that was overcrowded with 17 candidates and a Ted Cruz who was playing this game of expecting to inherit Trump's support because Trump was self-destruct and he didn't and that destroyed Rubio and Jeb Bush, and that that was the story of 2016. That's one answer. The other answer is people may say, you know, I can do that trick of Trump's too. I think that this is an aberration. Because I don't, I don't think that we're seeing that 
2020 is going to look like 2016, but I don't know. And I should warn you that if, if it were a year ago and you'd asked me would Trump win the Republican nomination, I would have said no. So I am a known mispredictor. <laughs> so, on the other hand, what's interesting is find me an American expert who predicted correctly. Very interesting. I can think about one. So, it's, so in other words, everybody was wrong on this. And then the question is, because it was an aberration, or because we didn't read the trend properly? I'm going to take two questions from back here. Jolie, if you, yeah. Hi, uh, my name is uh, Mohammed Zia. Um, my mom is from Afghanistan, my dad is from Pakistan, but I became a U.S. citizen five years ago. Um, my question is more about uh, U.S. foreign policy, particularly in the Middle East. Uh, the Obama administration has had a smaller appetite for adventurism as compared to the Bush administration. Uh, but Hillary Clinton's rhetoric seems to be a lot more assertive when it comes to U.S. foreign policy. So how do you see that playing out? Um, depending on who wins, uh, whoever our president is, do you think that uh, she will be more assertive? Uh, somewhat. To, I, I, it's, a, it's a very important and good question. Uh, there's a book by Steve Sustanovich, who's a professor at Columbia, which uh, says that American foreign policy goes through cycles of sort of overachievement and retrenchment. And over, uh, Bush, uh, George W. Bush, was overreaching, and Obama is retrenchment. It's not the same as isolationism. Eisenhower was a retrencher, and he was not an isolationist. Obama is not an isolationist, but he's, he has been a retrencher. I think Hillary is less of a retrencher than Obama. I think she's, she is likely to have a somewhat more activist foreign policy than Obama, particularly in relation to the Middle East. Uh, I don't happen to agree with that, but, but, but I'm just trying to describe it. Uh, the, Could you give color to that, Joe? What does it mean to have a more activist policy towards... Well, she, she had talked um, six months ago about having a no-fly zone in Syria. I don't know what a no-fly zone in Syria means when you have uh, Russian airplanes there and if you don't have, um, uh, you know, if, if, if you'd had a no-fly zone two years ago, it's different. I'm not sure a no-fly zone works now, and whether I mean, you can get different answers from different people about it. So let me not go into the merits or demerits of it, but it is, a, it is more active than the Obama administration has been willing to do. So that's a concrete example. Um, she, hasn't, she didn't say that in her San Diego speech. That, I don't know if that means she's dropped off it or not, but that's a concrete example. Of, it's, not, it's, not a, it's not I'm going to send 50,000 troops into Syria. That's not Hillary. But will she do more? Uh, probably somewhat more, but it'll be on the margin. I, so I think the best predictor of Hillary's foreign policy, since she was Obama's Secretary of State for one term, uh, is It'll be more like Obama than not, but it'll probably have, at the margins, more activism than Obama. Uh, Connor? Right back. Uh, my name is Connor Lyons. I'm from Canada. My question pertains to cyber warfare, an increasingly prominent method through which state and non-state actors are interacting with each other. I wonder if you could comment on the extent to which the United States and other countries are sufficiently uh, preparing to deal with cyber warfare and or could do that more effectively and, and how that kind of relates to, to different methods of soft power and hard, hard power to, uh, to deter or to react to cyber warfare. And perhaps we could take Yang Zhu's question as well. Thanks, Professor Nai. My name is Yan I'm, I'm Chinese myself. Um, last night, yesterday evening, there was uh, Professor David Shambao, which is a renowned China political scientist speaking at China Center in Oxford. And he was arguing that China's hard power is increasing, but soft power is still quite weak. I think my question is, if Trump becomes the president of the U.S. and President Xi Jinping continued as president for his second term, 
how do you envision China-U.S. relationship? Would it become increasingly become um, the hot, hot power competition? Well, on the first question on, on cyber, uh, I gave a talk at lunch at Nuffield on this, so I don't want to uh, uh, repeat the details of it. But cyber has become a, a much more prominent part of American foreign policy. In 2007, if you looked at the Director of National Intelligence report to the Congress in which he listed the major threats that the United States faced internationally, cyber wasn't in the top 10. Uh, the year before last and last year, cyber was number one. So that gives you some illustration of the increased importance which has been attached to cyber. Um, and it has become a major issue uh, in foreign policy. And uh, uh, I, I could go on. I talked for an hour about this at lunch, like so go on and on, but I won't. But the point is I can give you some things that, that some references that you could read on that. On, um, but, the, but the short answer to your question is yes, it's becoming more important and likely to stay that way, which is why I've been spending a lot of my time in the last several years trying to relate uh, traditional international relations theory to cyber. Uh, on China, um, I happened to have spent Saturday with David Shambaugh at the, uh, at the uh, China Center here at Oxford. And uh, uh, I think he's correct that China's hard power is measured by its economic and military capacity is increasing. I think there's been an overestimation of China's hard power. Um, and I think some of the, uh, Martin Wolf once said that China was a premature superpower. Premature in the sense that people looked at the shape of the curve of Chinese growth, extrapolated it to the future, and assumed that it was now, and it's not. Uh, you know, in 19, no, in 2014, the Financial Times had a front page headline saying that China had now passed the United States as the largest economy in the world. And um, then you read the fine print and you notice that it was in purchasing power parity. Well, when you're dealing with military power, uh, purchasing power parity is the wrong measure. You use exchange rates. You don't import oil or jet engines at PPP. That may be great for telling you about welfare and haircuts, but it's not the way you pay for your oil. And if you do exchange rates, at the time that the FT was preparing to call China number one, uh, China was a $10 trillion economy. The US was an $18 <coughs> trillion economy. That's what I mean when I say there's been a, a systematic exaggeration even of, of hard power. I don't, I mean, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. China has done an extraordinarily good job of raising hundreds of millions of people out of poverty, and I, and I give them full credit for it. But there is a great danger of taking a straight line and extrapolating it and thinking that is a measure of power for the future. Uh, and we've seen that already with the decline in the growth rate. Uh, when people were doing this extrapolation, they were counting on double-digit growth. Now the official number, as you know, is six, six and a half. But uh, uh, Larry Summers recently published a piece that said we should expect it on a, a regression to the mean that it's more likely to be about 3.8 or 3.9 sometime in the next few years. So we, nobody knows what the growth rate will be. But the one thing we do know is when you're projecting a straight line into the future, you're likely to be wrong. It's not a good way to do history or projections. So yes, China's hard power is increasing not as much as, as people think. On China's soft power, China's soft power has also increased. Um, and part of the increase represents uh, admiration for traditional Chinese culture which is very admirable. Uh, it also represents this extraordinary success 
that China has had of raising people out of poverty, of, 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 uh, of doing some very important and impressive things. Um, uh, I was in Beijing a little while ago and I took the, uh, the high-speed train down to Shenzhen where I was offered an honorary degree for my troubles. And I thought, this, uh, this, if the United States had this, we'd be lucky. We need Chinese assistance to do our rail system. To, to, that's, a, that's a trivial anecdote, but that's soft power. I mean, China has done things that are very impressive. But there are limits to China's soft power, too, and they're, they're really twofold. And I think this is what David was getting at, since he and I think quite alike on this. Uh, China's soft power is limited in part by the fact that it cannot give freedom to its civil society because party control would be violated by that. And much of a country's soft power is generated not by government, but by civil society. And if you lock up the, uh, the dissidents, if you, um, if you don't allow civil society to, uh, to have the freedom to say and speak and create, it sets a limit on, uh, on soft power. Um, and uh, so that's one limit, which is that party control makes it difficult to unleash the full creativity of Chinese civil society. I gave a lecture at Beida on this once, and I mentioned Ai Weiwei. And, uh, you know, there was a little shudder in the room. But that's a sign of limits. I mean, Ai Weiwei is a great advantage for China. The fact that he's been treated the way he has been is a way in which China self-limits its soft power. The other limit on China's soft power is uh, its disputes with its neighbors. If you are going to set up a Confucius Institute in Manila to demonstrate the glories of traditional Chinese culture, and you also send your coastal patrol ships to chase Philippine fishing boats out of Scarborough Shoal, which is within what the Philippines declares as its 200-mile exclusive economic zone. I'm not getting into the whether that's accurate or inaccurate. I'm just saying that's the way the Philippines see it. You're not going to get much soft power from your culture at the Confucius Institute. The Philippines are going to say, these people are using force and hard power to chase us from what is what we think are fishing grounds. And China says, oh no, this is traditionally Chinese fishing grounds and we'll use force to chase you out. Well, that's a choice China can make, but you're not gonna get much luck with your Confucius Institute so long as you do that. And if you look at the number of disputes that China has with neighbors, Philippines and Vietnam and Japan and India, that limits Chinese soft power as well. But Joe, you're, you're an advisor to Hillary Clinton on Asia. I, I want to say without wanting to pin you down, but of course that's exactly what I would like to do. Um, because are you going to advise her to contain China's ambitions in the Pacific? Is, would, would your advice be, you know, unleash America's Navy, stop the encroachments on the atolls, contain China's expansion into the Pacific, as some see it? What, what will your advice to her be, and what do you think she'll do? Well, it, 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 uh, American policy toward China has not been containment, and in fact, that's something I helped to shape when I was in the Bill Clinton administration. At that time, there were people who said, contain China before it comes too strong, and the policy we designed was just the opposite. We said, containment is, would not succeed, A, and if you treat China as an enemy, you're guaranteeing an enemy for the future. So in fact, we supported China's entry into the WTO and accepted a huge trade deficit with China. So our policy has been just the opposite of that. 
I don't think you want to change that now. Um, and I think the, the, uh, uh, the, the problems with China can be managed. There are problems, but uh, if you look at, at, and this goes back to the question about cyber, three years ago, there were major issues in US-China relations, which were bitterly disputed in Washington. One was currency. Are the Chinese deliberately manipulating the currency for trade advantage? A second was climate. After the Copenhagen meeting, where China and the US came out differently, that was regarded as a, a, a tremendous difference. A third was cyber, in which we complained continually about China using cyber means to steal intellectual property. And a fourth was the South China Sea. Now what's interesting is that on the first three of those issues, we have managed to resolve them in a reasonable way with the Chinese. The Chinese and the US came to a similar position in Paris in December on climate. Uh, on exchange rates, there's not a big controversy anymore. On cyber, at the uh, summit between Xi Jinping and Obama last uh, September, uh, Xi Jinping came out with a statement saying that China would not use cyber for commercial espionage. Note the importance of the word commercial. Uh, we, we use that cyber for espionage. We don't use it for commercial espionage. China had never been willing to say that before, but they did. So three of the four big issues have been managed. Um, I don't want to use the word resolved because you never know when an issue can reemerge, but three of the issues have been managed. The, the fourth is the most difficult, which is on the South China Sea, where the American position has been, we don't take a position on any of the rocks or atolls or islands in the South China Sea. The issues of sovereignty are issues between China and five other, four other countries. We take a position on freedom of navigation, which should be guided by the law of the sea. And if you pile sand on a submerged reef, it does not make it an island with a 12-mile territorial sea or an extended economic zone under the law of the sea treaty. So to make that point, we have sailed naval ships through that 12-mile zone just to say, look, you can't pile sand on a rock and call it an island. That's not what the law says. Now, would I advise her to continue freedom of navigation operations? Yes. Would I advise her to make this a major issue? No, I would advise her to try to get this back into a box in which we have a position you solve your sovereign issues with others. Don't mess with freedom of navigation. Don't use the nine dash line to try to make the South China Sea a Chinese lake. That's, uh, that's something where we, we in China could manage the problem. The problem is on the Chinese side, as the growth rate goes down, the legitimacy of the party is called into question and China increases the dose of nationalism in the formula which legitimizes party control. And the net effect of that is you, you try to say, maybe we should make a compromise on one of these reefs or atolls or rocks. It's very hard to do inside China. As soon as you say that, there's going to be somebody else who's going to eat your lunch politically because you're not nationalistic enough and they'll invoke the hundred years of humiliation and all the rest of this. So it's more of a China problem or a problem for inside Chinese domestic politics than an American problem. Thank you. Questions from over this side. So if we can bring the microphone, we'll take both of these questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm Nimad Bijan, Oxford Princeton Global Leaders Fellow. I have two questions first. Uh, the former U.S. ambassadors for Afghanistan, um, 
U.S. commanders and also envoys wrote, wrote an open letter to President Obama to keep the current level of U.S. troops in Afghanistan. What was your advice for President Obama? Second, uh, this is on about the other side of, uh, from the other perspective, uh, about the U.S. foreign policy. How do you assess the U.S. foreign policy towards Pakistan? Uh, because um, on the one hand, the U.S. is supporting a state building in Afghanistan, the troops are on the ground, and on the other hand, uh, the insurgents, the Taliban, are based in Pakistan. Osama was killed in Pakistan, the former leader of the Taliban were uh, killed in Pakistan, having a Pakistani passport. What would be your advice for the future president of the U.S.? Thank you. Did you catch the question on Afghanistan? Uh, the first uh, question, the answer is easy, which is that I chaired a Council on Foreign Relations uh, special group on U.S.-India relations. And because of the importance of India, we recommend, and of Afghanistan to India, we recommended that the American troop level in Afghanistan be left as it is. So that's a clear answer to your question. On the second question of Pakistan, Pakistan has long played a double game, uh, partly because there isn't one government. There's uh, the civilian elected government, and there's the military government with the ISI. And so you can get an answer from civilian officials that says one thing, and you wind up with the ISI doing just the opposite. Uh, so, you know, uh, you can believe, if you want, that, uh, that the ISI didn't know that bin Laden was living for years within 40 miles of Ralpindi. I don't believe it, but I don't. Uh, but would they look an American official in the eye and lie to them? Constantly. And so what is the alternative? The alternative is the Americans try to break relations with Pakistan or say we won't deal with them. What we do is we try to negotiate as best we can and to work and strengthen the civilian government as best we can, but we're not able to overcome ISI or the Pakistani military. So you wind up bargaining with them. So essentially, um, when you know you're being lied to, what do you do? You go in and you kill bin Laden and you don't tell the Pakistanis first. Because if you told them first, they would tip him off. So that's the nature of the relationship. Uh, is it something that one admires? No. But what's the alternative? Uh, Susan. We have a microphone. Thank you. I'm Susan Thomas. I work with the government of India. So while still on Asia, I want to bring in the elephant uh, into the room, so to speak. Um, uh, we have had a very interesting um, you know, set of developments in India itself with uh, a right-wing government in, in place and a prime minister to whom a visa was rejected first a couple of year, uh, you know, years ago. And then we saw that, you know, um, he went on to have a massive reception in the U.S. What would be your analysis or your premonition if Trump were to come? Uh, how would that voice be uh, in terms of Indo-U.S. Um, relationship, right-wing, right-wing? Um, and you know, how would you locate India within this entire uh, conversation of Afghanistan and Pakistan and China as well? Well, the, the uh, Council on Foreign Relations study group that I co-chaired with the head of Warburg Pincus, so it was a businessman and an academic. Uh, the headline uh, conclusion was that India was extremely important to the United States and that we should be paying much more attention to India. So it was a, uh, and it's, I happen to believe it as well as having written it. Um, I, uh, so India is, uh, has a, become a, a major focus in American foreign policy. 
There are all sorts of problems in the U.S. Indian relations, and I don't need to rehearse them for you. But by and large, if you look at the Obama administration, I would say Obama has, uh, has made India-U.S. relations a success story. And what's interesting is here is a slightly left of center cerebral academic law professor in the United States dealing with a man who is who has come up from the bottom, I guess, what is he, son of a tea seller or something, who uh, uh, was prohibited from having a visa to come to the U.S. a decade ago because of the way he handled the riots in Gujarat and who has used uh, uh, Hinduism and Hindutva to strengthen is the position of the BJP, not a left of center party. And yet, right now in Washington, Obama and Modi are sitting down uh, as close friends. And Modi uh, invited Obama to Republic Day. Uh, so it's a very interesting combination. But you would say that Obama, if you, if you just looked at it from a distance, you say Obama's natural preferences would be Congress in internal politics. But in fact, uh, the view that India is extremely important has led to a rapprochement between India and the U.S., which antecedes uh, Obama, I mean, George W. Bush gets credit for it. Actually, Bill Clinton starts some of it. Uh, and I would expect that will continue. I mean, I expect that the U.S.-Indian relationship will continue to get warmer. And part of it is the question of how do you deal with a rising China. It's not an alliance against China, but India does have a lot of fear of China. And when I go to India, the top level people will tell you about how great relations are. And then as soon as you're finished with the public statement and you sit down to have a drink, they'll tell you how worried they are about Chinese aggression. So there's a double game that, that goes on there. Um, so in that sense, India wants to have better relations with the US, not an alliance, but just better relations. But it's more than that. If you look at uh, American foreign policy, American foreign policy is always influenced. We're a nation of immigrants. Our foreign policy is always influenced by the origins of where, India, where people come from. And the Indian diaspora has just become much more influential than it used to be. I mean, if you look in Congress, there is a an India caucus in both the Senate and in the House. And uh, so it's it, that plus economic relations and trade and so forth. I think you, I would expect that U.S.-Indian relations will continue to, uh, to get closer. Right. I'm afraid I'm going to have to, I, as always happens, we've got a load more questions. Um, but I'm going to have to call things to a close. And just before I ask uh, Silvana from the Blavatnik School to give a word of thanks to Professor Joseph Nye, I would just like to alert your attention to the fact that tomorrow, here, in the same place, at the same time, we have another former dean of the Kennedy School. Um, two issues have really become sharp in this American presidential election. One, foreign policy, which Professor Joseph Nye, former dean of the Kennedy School, has really helped us to understand tonight. The other huge and searing issue for America is around inequality and poverty. And so Professor David Elwood, tomorrow night at five o'clock, will speak on that issue, on poverty and on upward social mobility, um, an issue on which he's done fabulous research over the years. So I hope you'll join me for that. But and let, let, me, let me recommend it. <laughs> <laughs> I know David Elwood. <laughs> he is worth listening to. But let me now ask one of the Master of Public Policy students, Silvana, to introduce herself and thank our speaker on behalf of the school. My name is Silvana. I am a student here at the Vlavadnik School of Government. I am from Colombia. 
And as a previous student of international relations, it's a pleasure to meet you and to have you here. And on behalf of everybody, I wanted to thank you uh, for these thoughtful ideas of what uh, we can expect from American poli uh, public policy, uh, foreign policy, sorry. And thank you for being here. Well, thank you. Thank you. Many thanks.